be continuing in the book of Matthew, but I thought given uh, Mother's Day that uh, I would shift it forward a little bit, and uh, as, as you'll see that we're not too far off the mark, but there was a, a scripture uh, that referred to a mother doing uh, what mothers do, and I just couldn't help but appreciate that and thought, well, this would probably be a good time to, uh, to maybe point that out, and we could relate it to the joy uh, the joys of having a, a good mom and the ways in which uh, that good mom can really point us to what it means uh, to understand what real greatness is. And I think a, a great mom can definitely do that. It sets a uh, foundation of values, doesn't it, to have a great mom? And, uh, and you know, I thanked uh, my mom yesterday. I was so grateful uh, my parents came up. I hadn't seen them, probably my mom, in over a year just because of COVID, and they live far away, and we're real busy. We're, we're knee-deep in grandkids at this point, and it's hard to get away. So they drove up here. My dad's now retired, and uh, I was grateful to, to have that moment with them and uh, to be able to express my thanks uh, once again. Right? I need to keep doing it over and over because my mom... I uh, was one of those ladies that uh, just lifted up her son and, and made me feel like I could do anything. And uh, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? When you have that confidence uh, that someone is rooting for you. So uh, as we look at the scripture today, uh, I've titled my sermon, A Mother's Love. And I can appreciate it, right? Here we have uh, the disciples. And the disciples apparently are definitely talking to their parents about what's going on with Jesus and, and all that he's doing and the things that he's saying. And uh, uh, interestingly, mom shows up with uh, John and James. And she puts a pitch in to Jesus for her sons, right? Why? Because she loves them. And she wants what's best for them. Uh, so she uh, used her own assertiveness to make a request of Jesus. And once again, uh, Jesus is so good. He doesn't, uh, you know, chastise her or, or uh, you know, say anything in a way that, you know, puts her down. But he redirects, you know, what she's asking uh, to, to the sense of understanding what it really means to be uh, someone that is uh, close to Jesus. That, it, that is going to bring about suffering and, and is not all as glorious as one might think. So uh, let me read that scripture to you and we're going to think about that. What does greatness really uh, do what is it? How does it function? So let me read it to you. Uh, Matthew chapter twenty. Well, it's verses twenty through twenty-eight. If you haven't found it, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked, and she replied, "In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you." one on your right hand and the other on your left. But Jesus answered that by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. You're, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are, are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or left my father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. And when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, that they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it, you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, there's our scripture today. Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer uh, to bring some uh, clarity to mind. Lord God, we're here today and... Uh, we're filled of thoughts of our moms and, Lord, whether they are uh, gone and with you, Lord, or maybe they're still here. And we just ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would bless them, that, uh, that they would understand, Lord, uh, all that they've done in life for their children. And we do ask for their, uh, a blessing for them. And, Lord, as we seek to understand in the scriptures how this might affect us, we pray for clear minds. We pray for uh, a heart ready to receive all that's uh, good and right in your word, Lord, that it might change us. And I pray that you help me to be clear and, 
and as brief as necessary that, uh, uh, that I can be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can't help but be a little bit kind of kind of chuckle at that, right? Uh, almost maybe you feel a little embarrassed for James and John, right? They show up with mom and mom, uh, you know, is trying to sway the will of Jesus by promoting her sons. And uh, I, I love that. I, and I thought, well, why not talk about moms relating around that? I think there's a lot more there, too, that we'll talk about. But uh, I can, ex- I, you know, I can respect the mother of James and John and and she loves her sons and wants what's best for them. And uh, so the fact that she does that is, is such a touching thing. And it's no wonder, really. We just came from Matthew 19, just to remind you, right? We were talking about uh, Jesus, and he was saying, I assure you, this is Matthew 19, 28. Uh, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, right? So Jesus is talking about thrones. And I suspect, you know, the mothers picking up on this and thinking, wow, if there are thrones to be sat on, I want my sons to be there. I want them to have the most prominent thro- uh, thrones. She wants what's best for her sons. Um, and, and really, Jesus is talking about the renewal of all things, that there would be a, a kingdom that's going to come. So the mother of James and John came to Jesus with her two sons and bowed before him. And when Jesus inquired what her request was, right, she asked that her two sons might be granted places of favor in his kingdom, one on his right, one on his left. And I think, uh, you know, you can't falter. Interestingly, I think we see here that Jesus didn't correct her uh, as to the fact of his coming kingdom. His only question was addressed to the two sons. So really, they show up with mom. Mom makes the request. But Jesus' answer really is to James and John. And he speaks to them, and they respond. Uh, But as we look at the scribe sheet today, the main idea is that moms, what moms do points us, and I didn't ask Wendy, point us to what Uh, Real greatness looks like. Points or point? I did it with the S. I'm independent. I can now correct my own grammar. I got to take the apostrophe off moms. (laughs) You couldn't let me have my moment, huh? But that's okay. It's your day. I'll let you have it. What moms do, because moms, it's all moms, right? Not one mom. Uh, What moms do points us to what real greatness looks like. Isn't that the case? To have a mom, a great mom, doesn't that kind of define what greatness is? And not just what greatness is, but what greatness does. Moms do great things. And because of that, we get a sense of what greatness is. And I think, you know, God gave us families. He gave us fathers and mothers. These things really, don't they tie into, you know, the creative nature of how God wants to relate to us? right? He wants us to be his children. He wants us to see him as father, right? And uh, so that parental, you know, relational element is part of his design. So when moms do what moms do, I think they point to the greatness of God. And I think, you know, there are different, you know, people who have done different, you know, uh, uh, People have struggled to be moms, and some moms have done terrible jobs. I get that, and there are you know, circumstances for why that is. But you know, when, when a mom uh, is a mom, not perfect, but the mom uh, who you can appreciate, it does point us to what real greatness looks like. So what does real greatness do as we think about it? And I would have put that question at the top. What does real greatness do? And I think as we think about it, it definitely relates to what a great God does. The first thing, you know, we see here in the scriptures is uh, standing by you and promoting your good. That's the first point on the scribe sheet, standing by you and promoting your good. Isn't that everything that God is, right? As we think about moms, they're standing with us. They're really seeking to make something of our lives by investing in us, teaching us the difference between right and wrong, how to show compassion, how to be hardworking, how to respect your elders, how to do your chores. All of those things are for your benefit. 
So they stand by us and they promote our good. And, and we know that that's the case with God. When it comes to God, he is standing with us, right? He has not abandoned us in our sin. And he's promoting our uh, righteousness. He wants us to grow in righteousness. He wants us to grow in and holiness and in our understanding of him and, and to make something of our lives that one day we'll stand before him and he'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. He wants his kids to grow up right and to be successful. So standing by you and promoting your good is what a great mom does and it's what a great God does as well. And moms are amazing, you know what I mean? They tire, tirelessly work to make a home and to raise their babies. It's a labor of love, but it is a labor, isn't it? It's work, you know? And sometimes I see the moms kind of drag in here on Sunday morning, and you can only imagine what they've gone through to get here, right? Getting all the kids up and washed off and getting dressed, making sure they all look right and getting them in the car and keeping, you know, dad from losing it because he's frustrated. And, uh, you know, it's amazing all that they do. It is work, And I think, you know, especially the young moms, oftentimes uh, it has to do with being patient with probably a less mature man is right. We we lag a little. We we uh, we come up from the the back end here uh, in our maturity. So the, the young moms are dealing with that as well. And nowadays, right, I know, you know the whole feminist movement has made good progress, but I think in some ways they've kind of kept going off the cliff. And they've put a burden on women that, uh, you know, is, is, I can't imagine what it must be like. Uh, but nowadays, they need to add, a, a lot of times, a full-time job on top of being a mom and doing all the things a mom does. Uh, so we need to lift moms up. We need to encourage them. They do so much. And there's challenges, right? The challenges of balancing what needs to be done, dealing with the expectations of others, not losing sight of what's important. And there is nothing more beautiful than motherhood, right? Think about it. Uh, I heard someone put it this way that, you know, uh, really to be able to create another human being, right, to have a baby is a superpower. You know, it's like, wow. You know, to think that, uh, you know, as a woman, you can have a child. uh, As a society, we should be promoting and celebrating that very thing. That should be something that uh, should stand above all other accomplishments that could have happened. So as we think about it, there are some definite, some heavy burdens on the ladies these days. And uh, even just to read Proverbs 31, why don't you turn to Proverbs 31? I'm exhausted by the end of it, you know, and I I don't really see a very similar description of a man, right? What's the the man's description? Yeah, you know, I know men do a lot and uh, they're to be appreciated as well. But boy, God really uh, put a list here that might make uh, most ladies kind of uh, sigh and think, man, am I doing all this? But at the same time, I think a lot of us would say, yeah, they did do that. They did work, you know, doing those things. But uh, a mother is a wife and, you know, Proverbs 31 is a, a... a virtuous and capable wife, but you know that wife is also taking care of all your babies. So a Proverbs 31 uh, woman, it says, who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies, right? She's treasure. And it says in verse 11, her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Verse 17, I thought I'd skip through. She is energetic, and strong, a hard worker. She might not look like she has a, a lot of energy, but she's, you've probably just seen her, ex, you know, after she's expended a lot of energy and uh, strength. And then move down to verse 25. It says she's clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Right? There's a confidence there. And when she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. And then that verse 30, charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. What a shining example of what it means to be a great woman. And not only that, a great mother. And that's a beautiful thing because as we read 
the exceptional nature of a, of a virtuous and capable wife and, a, and an amazing mother. Uh, moms do for us more than just serve us. Uh, they point us uh, in the direction of what real greatness is. Uh, and I, we know that our Lord worked tirelessly for us. That is the gospel, the presentation of the fact that, you know what, uh, God has done so much for you. Do you know that, right? Uh, a lot of times, you know, we lose sight of the fact that some people don't know the gospel. They don't know the good news. They have a sense of God. He's the creator. He gave the commandments. He wants us to be good. But to not know uh, how he has tirelessly and sacrificially provided for us is to miss the, you know, the significance of God. And I think the significance of a mom is, is just as, uh, as striking, right? Moms do so much. And they point us to what real greatness looks like. So a mother, uh, so interestingly, you know, we see the mother here doing what a uh, mom would do. And maybe you could kind of feel a little embarrassed because she doesn't get it. But let's face it, right? Didn't the disciples, the disciples seem to be kind of in their own little world. And they don't really seem to know you know, uh, exactly what Jesus is getting at. They're kind of fighting over positions, right? Didn't Peter, not too long ago, ask the question, what do we get? You know, we've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. What do we get? And, uh, and they're not seeming to pick up on that sense of what humility is and what it means to be a servant. And uh, so here, as we see a mother serving her sons, uh, I'd like to think that, the, you know, she didn't just serve her sons by bringing that request of Jesus, she didn't realize that she was already serving her sons by raising them and loving them in a sacrificial way uh, so that they would understand what it means to be sacrificial, uh, to give up all, to work tirelessly for someone else. So in my mind, she had, you know, this mother had already helped her boys know what it means to be great. And the scriptures reflect that. God honors moms, let's face it. Psalm 113.9 says, uh, He gives the childless woman a family, making her a happy mother. Uh, praise the Lord, right? We know motherhood is a gift from God, and it's not uh, for every woman. You know, that is a, a nature of this world, right? God is in charge. Um, it doesn't make a, a woman any less not to have children, but the ones that he does give children, right, it brings happiness, and the analogies, they're used as symbols. First Thessalonians chapter uh, 2. Why don't you turn there? It's a good amount of scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 2, 7 through 10, shows us, right, uh, even the way in which the scriptures and the apostles use uh, motherhood as a symbol to be appreciated. It says in verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 2, As the apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you, or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own, uh, her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. So here, the apostles are sharing with the people, you know how much we loved you? We loved you just as much as a mother loves her children and provides and serves them, right? That's, that's a, an honoring of the, that uh, office of motherhood. Proverbs 1.8 speaks about, you know, one of the elements of parenting, uh, being a mom is uh, instructing. My child, listen, when your father corrects you, don't neglect your mother's instructions. How many of you still have those sayings that mom kept saying to you over and over and over that you continue to say to yourself? Even now, does anyone have one that pops to mind? I know that's putting you on the spot, but uh, what are some of the things your mom might have said to you that you still remember today? It's kind of a spontaneous thought. Evelyn, you're still young. You can remember them, right? <laughs> Garbage in, garbage out, right? She'll, she'll remind herself of that throughout her life because mom instructed and taught her. In the back of your head, as garbage is put before you, with this, yeah, <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. And uh, Any others? What are you advertising? Yeah, that's right. As, a, you know, as you think about how you're dressing, mom's voice in the back of your ear, what are you advertising? 
I couldn't help thinking of the one, uh, you know, uh, when you get frustrated with what you're doing, uh, you know, a man running for his life will never notice. <laughs> Even the humor of it can kind of make light of the sense, you know, when you start getting down on yourself, you know, to think of the funny things your parents tell you, your mom tells you, uh, to make you chuckle and go, you know what, it's maybe not that important uh, what I'm frustrated with. We even see in Second Timothy, uh, actually, I guess First Thessalonians. Um, well, I guess so we'll keep going. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse five. Uh, here we see how Timothy came to know the Lord. Uh, Paul says to him, "I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice." And I know that same faith continues strong in you, right? That instruction is not just on, you know, principles of life, but the instructions on the Lord, what Jesus should mean to you and how he should find his way into your life. Timothy was a follower of the Lord because his grandmother and his mother taught him about a God who loves his creation, about a God who would provide a Messiah. Uh, And Timothy, it changed his life, right? He sacrificed uh, his life in service to Christ. And then even Proverbs 29, uh, talking about discipline. To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child, right? One of those elements of discipline. Uh, Women discipline their kids. Why do they do it? Because they love them. Why does God discipline you and I? Because he loves us. Uh, it's not hard to see the parallels and how, you know, the symbols of mothers used uh, make sense. And really, God elevates moms. Think about it. Exodus twenty twelve, honor your mother and, and father, uh, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land and the Lord your God, the Lord your God has given you. He put it in the Ten Commandments. Honor your mothers. Right? He's elevating the the office of motherhood and say, you see that? That's something special. That's something that should mean something to you. That's something that you should acknowledge and honor. And you know what? I think by God doing that, pointing to the greatness of motherhood, uh, in the sense he's pointing to the greatness of himself. He made motherhood. He made, you know, the whole institution. And he is great. And we see that in moms. There were penalties for disobeying in in Israel, right? Under the theocracy of, you know, being a people of God, living under his rule, you know, to be a disobedient child came with severe consequences. If you were someone that hit your parents, there would be severe consequences. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, just to show you, right, the seriousness of of needing to honor your mother. It says, suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. In such a case, the father and, mon- uh, father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. So, right, this kid has grown up. And then, then it says, then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. That's some serious acknowledgement of the ways in which we should honor our moms. And that isn't for us today, right? That was under the reign of God in the nation of Israel. And that was the reality, right? For you to dishonor your mother is to dishonor God. And there's no place for people to, that dishonor God amongst him. Proverbs twenty twenty, right? Here's a good warning for the young folks. If you insult your father or mother, your light will be snuffed out in total darkness. That's a good one, right, Adam? <laughs> If you insult your father and mother, your light will be snuffed out in total darkness. So uh, God honors and elevates moms, and I like that. Even uh, Jesus' claim against the Pharisees, one of the sins was that they were disrespectful to their parents, disrespectful to the mother, uh, not wanting to support them but give money to some other cause in their name. And that was shameful, and Jesus pointed that out. We do know that there's a limit to motherhood, right? There is a, a time in which our children uh, are growing up. And, you know, I even mentioned it this morning, right, where all of a sudden, like, our sons 
are captivated by a different woman, right? Uh, their own woman, and, and the place of mom becomes less. And, uh, and that's just the way it goes. And, and really, Genesis 2.24 speaks to that, right? It explains why a man leaves his mother and, and father and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, right? Mom kind of stands in the background at some point, right? And it's sometimes hard. Sometimes you're relieved and think, all right, I've done my job. I'm ready to relax for a little bit. But uh, it's interesting, you know, and even the, the priority of relationship with Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37, if you love your father and mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. So things are all in their place. Our relationship with God has to be first. And in some circumstances, you're going to make your mom mad. You might make your mom, you know, ostracize you. You hear the testimonies of, of people that have come to Christ from other religions and they don't talk to their kids anymore. We need to know that, you know, obviously moms are to be honored, but when it comes to honoring God, honoring God comes first. And even if that hurts relationship, Luke 12, 53, Jesus is saying, you know, what I'm about to bring is going to bring some division. He says a father will be divided against his son and a son against his father, a mother against daughter and daughter against mother. So when it comes to priorities, right, moms were meant to point to greatness, real greatness, and that real greatness is Christ. And he is the one that should come first and above all else. So Jesus relates to, uh, to James and John. You know, he kind of honors the, the mother's request by at least kind of answering to the boy saying, you don't know what you're asking, right? To sit at my left and right hand. And he begins to speak about the fact that what he was about to go through was suffering. He says, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? And James and John, I think maybe naively think, oh yes, we're able. And they said, yeah, we're willing to do whatever it takes. And Jesus' answer is, you know what? Uh, I believe you. Obviously, Jesus knew the future, and, and he says, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit at my right hand or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. So there, again, we see you know, this plan, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working in conjunction for the betterment, the promotion of you. Uh, here, the Father plays the part of preparing the places uh, for the ones uh, that he chose to be in places of uh, authority and honor. That, and Jesus points that out. That's not, that's not what I'm deciding. The Father decides that. So verse 24 is kind of a, you know, makes me chuckle. Look at verse 24 back in Matthew uh, 20. If you could turn back to that. And, uh, you know, here are the disciples, right? The disciples are all kind of struggling for position. They're trying to figure out who's the greatest among them. And, you know, they're still naive and, and confused. So here it says in verse 24, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant, right? The other ten disciples, when they saw James and John show up with mom to put a pitch in, they were like, oh, you know, I can't believe that. And, uh, and it was probably because they hadn't thought of it, right? <laughs> they were probably thinking, they brought their mother, that's ingenious. Why didn't I think of that? And uh, they would have done anything to get an edge, right, on who was the greatest among them. And so I think their indignation was had more to do with the fact that they hadn't thought of it. Don't you think? That's kind of how uh, they rolled. Uh, just to go back to my scribe sheet, I don't want to miss some of those. That second point of what does it mean... Uh, to see what real greatness does. A mom serves as an example of sacrifice, and uh, we've talked about that, um, and we see the sacrifices, and you've experienced the sacrifices of a mom in your life. What does real greatness look like? Serving as an example of sacrifice. And doesn't that point to real greatness? Isn't that the best thing about the Christian faith? The fact that God doesn't say, you need to make some sacrifice and bring them here before me, otherwise I'm just going to cast you out. The God of the Christian faith is the real God because he's the one that just makes, blows you away. 
He says, I provide the sacrifice. I do what is necessary in order for you to be whole. Serving as an example of sacrifice. And a mom does that, doesn't she? You look at her and, and she works herself to the bone for you. And because of that, we're thankful. And because of that, we know real greatness, don't we? Real greatness is serving as an example of sacrifice. And I, I appreciate that about my mom. I know my mom is uh, you know, a very giving woman. And she has... Uh, always served as an example. And I was spoiled rotten, wasn't I? You know, I, I, I hear about moms teaching their kids to do their laundry and stuff and, you know, teaching them good principles. When I got out of the Army, my mom went right back to doing everything, even ironing my clothes. And uh, unfortunately, my poor wife had to, like, deprogram me from that. Uh, no, no, no moms are perfect, right? But, uh, but let's face it, she was, my mom, it was a labor of love. Isn't that why they do it, right? I, I didn't make her do it. She just wanted to do it. And maybe she maybe created a little bit of a monster in me, but uh, when you're used to being a person of sacrifice, it's hard to stop. But again, there is balance there, right? Uh, we want to teach our children to be wise and, and teach them to be thoughtful and thankful. So that is the greatest uh, compliment, is uh, serving as a, an example of sacrifice. And, and really, mothers are used as that symbol. Let's think about some of the symbols, right? Uh, we know in Matthew, in Matthew 23, Jesus is looking over Jerusalem. And what does he do? He uses the example of motherhood. He says, how often I have wanted to gather your chicks, right, as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't. Right? You wouldn't uh, let me. That's a promotion of motherhood, right? A, a hen uh, protects her chicks. I just saw this silly video, right, uh, on the internet. Uh, and it was, uh, a hall, you know, it was an alleyway, and there was this chicken with all these little chicks. And it was a, a king cobra snake going down the alley. I don't know if they orchestrated it or what, but they had a video of this. And this king cobra is going down, and, and you know what he wants, right? He's ready for some chicken nuggets. And... That, that hen went crazy, and she took on this cobra and was jumping and pecking, and eventually the cobra left. And that is, uh, you know, the love of a mother. It's a, a symbol of protection. And here in Matthew 23, Jesus refers to it to say, hey, you know, my love for you, God's love for you is like a mother's love. I want to gather you, and I want to protect you. And that is the call of, of salvation, right? That's God saying, come to me, all you who are, who are uh, burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll be that loving God who protects you. And I think sometimes, you know, people who have not grown up with a, a mother that loved them or even a father that loved them, uh, God becomes, you know, that person, that uh, relationship that will stand in the gap of maybe a missing relationship that you've had. Isaiah 49, God is relating with Israel, you know, his love for them. It's, and uh, would God ever forget his children? And the answer is never. Verse 15, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she was born? But even if, it, if that were possible, I would not forget. He's using examples of motherhood for his own love for his people. And then think about even like being born again. Right? Isn't that an imagery of, of what a mother brings to the table, the fact that she's given birth to you? And in the same way, Christ wants to give birth to you. He wants to bring you into new life to get you to cross a threshold, not a physical one, but a spiritual one, to be born of God. Another imagery, right? Uh, pointing to that symbolism of motherhood. What a joy that is. This would have been a nice one uh, for a potluck, right? And maybe take some time for people to share stories of their moms. Maybe we can do that next week uh, if you think about it. Bring a story of your maybe growing up, uh, some of the things that you remember and appreciate about your mom. Um, so back to Matthew chapter 20. We'll keep moving along. Uh, here the disciples are indignant, right? Remember that? They, they hadn't thought of it and they're a bit upset about it. 
one of the things that Jesus here is trying to do is to bring them back to what real greatness is again, right? It's another promotion of, of being uh, someone that recognizes real greatness in Christ, the fact that he is that ultimate uh, sacrifice that would be made on their behalf. And here, actually in this last section of Scripture of Matthew 20, for the first time, he begins to relate his death and what that death will mean. He says right at the bottom, verse 28, now I'm going to back up a little, but he says his life was going to be a ransom for many. My death will be in place of yours. I'm going to buy you. I'm going to purchase you through my death. And that's a significant thing here in the scriptures. Um, that on your scribe sheet, what does real greatness do, right? Not just standing uh, by you and promoting your good, serving as an example of sacrifice, but teaching you wisdom, and here Jesus is doing just that as well, pointing to what real greatness is, not just so that they could be great, but they could see that what Jesus was about to do, his suffering would be great. And it would be something to come alongside and to celebrate and to use that as uh, the vehicle for, of faith to bring you into a relationship where you trust him. A God who does that great thing for you is a God worthy of putting your faith and trust in. So Jesus calls them together, right? They're all indignant, kind of kicking dust on each other's feet. But Jesus calls them all together, right? And he says, you know what the rulers in this world uh, do. They lord it over their people and off officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. And as we think about what greatness and uh, you know, people who are great in God's kingdom are, you know, you can't help but go back to the fact that they're like moms. They're like moms. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Think about how our mothers have served us. Think about how our God has served us. Verse 27, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. Sometimes moms feel like slaves, amen? Do you ever, have you ever felt like a slave raising your kids? Maybe even caring for your husband. <laughs> I miss that shaking nod there. I, it's good. Um, but the way of the kingdom is a different way. It's not lording authority and power over people, but being a servant, becoming a slave to others. Verse 28, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. So here, real greatness is laid before his disciples to say, you know what? What real greatness looks like is me. I'm going to die for you. And I'm not just going to die. I'm going to be a ransom for many. I'd like to close my time with you just to read uh, some of the verses speaking about that same concept of, of real greatness, which is not just sacrifice, but uh, at ultimately elevating Christ. That's the fourth point on the scribe sheet. What does real greatness do if you want to be great? Uh, you elevate Christ. You point to the greatest of the greatest, the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings. He is the one who has sacrificed his own life in place of ours. John 129 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 1 Peter 2.24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And then finally, uh, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins once for a lifetime. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, you've given us uh, examples in our lives. Maybe, uh, maybe it's not just mom, but it's other relationships. Maybe it could be uh, anyone, a father, a friend, an uncle, or an aunt, or maybe a sibling, Lord. You've given us examples of greatness. When we see that greatness, uh, we cannot help but look back and to see your greatness, Lord, that they are really just reflections of your values, uh, reflections of your characteristics, Lord. Uh, so we thank you today. We thank you for great moms because great moms prom uh, promote a great God. And 
Lord, you've shown how a mother is a symbol to the love that you have for us. And, uh, and we think of mom's sacrifices today, but Lord, we think of your sacrifice made in our place. Help us never to take it for granted. Help us to uh, use it to, to really make our lives uh, grow and become more and more uh, because how you have shown us, Lord, what it means to be a servant. Uh, so we thank you this day, Lord, for your example. We thank you for moms. In Jesus' name, amen.